Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Hyperledger Healthcare Special Interest Group. My name is Mike McCoy. I'm the chair of the group, and uh, we're going to get started into our first session of 2022 here. So uh, one, I want to be able to preference that this is an open source working group. Please do not share anything that is under NDA or that wouldn't be necessarily publicly available for you and your constituents and your stakeholders and your teams that you work with. Uh, we want to be able to make sure that no one is shamed here, that every, every idea and experience level of part of the blockchain and healthcare ecosystem working group uh, is, a, is not downed, is not frowned upon, and that we don't... Uh, we don't down anyone for their experiences or what they actually know in the space. So please have an open mind. Please have a positive mind when interacting with people here in the forum. Uh, I also then want to be able to uh, give room for introductions. So Michael was able to give an introduction as uh, he hasn't been part of the group for a while. Uh, I believe uh, Baldwin, uh, I don't know if you've been joining us before, but if you want, you have the floor, you can give an introduction on yourself. Hello, um, I'm just turning on my, my videos here. Um, my name is Baldwin Mack. I'm actually crashing this meeting because I was extended the invitation by um, one of my colleagues, uh, Uli Brodo, who's part of this group, I believe. Um, I am coming from Boringer Engelheim, a pharmaceutical company based in Germany. Um, uh, physically, I am located in Canada. Um, and what I the organization that I'm part of within BI is uh, we're part of the clinical development and operations um, uh, organization. So we're the ones who are developing the drugs and running, running the clinical trials to, to develop our new um, compounds for, for the various indications that we work, um, work in. So my interest in joining this group and in, in blockchain is because a couple of years ago in Canada, we ran a pilot looking at blockchain technology in the clinical trials. Um, and we've completed that project and I've since continued to work on applying blockchain in healthcare um, as part of the pharma ledger, which you can see in the back um, uh, background of that I have here, which is a IMI uh, consortium uh, of industry partners um, that that is halfway through our mandate to look at use cases in of, of blockchain in, in healthcare. Um, so I'm leading one of the groups, one of the work streams within that, that consortium. And so I'm joining this meeting because um, Lee introduced me to this group and I thought I'd sit in and just to find out what the discussion is about and, and to learn from everyone else that's on this team. Very happy to, to be here. Alwyn, thank you very much. We've had many different uh, Farm Ledger members uh, either present or be part of the discussion. So. Uh, glad to have you uh, added to the group. Excellent. And then Sean, I apologize. Sean, have you ever given an introduction before in this group? I don't believe so. And I'm sorry I was late. I was on another call. My name is Sean Bohan. I am a new community architect on the Hyperledger team. And I'm just lurking on calls to get up to speed on what's going on. I was uh, involved in Hyperledger Indie from 2017 to 2019. And uh, I'm back. So hi. Sean's back. That's all that matters. Now, welcome and uh, glad to know you're part of the, the Hyperledger team. That's a, it's awesome meeting new, new folks. Am I missing anyone that would like to give an introduction? I think that's everybody. All right, moving on. Uh, are there any community announcements? I see Pete actually mentioned one in the chat. Pete, if you want to talk further, we have it on upcoming events and presentations uh, between uh, for. Linux Foundation Public Health and Consensus Health with Daniela and Jim and Heather and I believe there's others, but please, uh, Pete, tell us more about it. Sure, thanks, uh, thanks, uh, Mike, and uh, Happy New Year to everyone. Um, yeah, as some people know, um, Consensus Health has, has really over the last few months really sort of developed and defined uh, the veteran community as a group, as a population group community that really requires a special focus in terms of healthcare. And we're doing a lot of stuff in that area. Um, made some announcements, which are on, on the consensus uh, health website. And one of the things we uh, kicked off 
uh, with Jim from the Linux Foundation Public Health is a special, um, I guess, focus on that within LFPH. Uh, I, I'm going to let Jim talk about that when he is ready to do so. I think he still needs to jump through one uh, one hurdle to before he can talk too much about that. But I think that's coming in about a couple of weeks. But uh, uh, kind of a, as a precursor to that, we, uh, we pulled together a webinar uh, at the last minute, as we always do at Consensus Health, as Mike probably remembers. Um, but we've got a great lineup. Uh, I mean, notably with, with Jim and Daniela, and the, the webinar is focused on open source and how it is, how using it can really benefit the veterans community. Um, and cover and obviously Heather's on the webinar talking a bit about what what we're doing uh, in that space, and also uh, Dave Metcalf from Global Blockchain Ventures, who's invested in some healthcare uh in companies and and in one of the initiatives that we, that we're doing in the in the veteran space so would love to see everyone on it all right pete thank you very much yeah uh global blockchain ventures as, a, as an investor of consensus health and of kaleido who provides a lot of uh, blockchain solutioning in the space as well uh before we do move forward i want to make sure Lincoln Fellingham, I don't know if you've been part of our group before, and we'd love to have an introduction, learn uh, what interests you in joining the group. Yeah, you bet. I've, <laughs> I've actually been on the uh, distribution list for a couple of years now, very infrequent attender, but uh, um, I'm a technology executive for a health healthcare supply chain company, a large one in the United States, and uh, have some substantial interest in blockchain and how it's developing. I was particularly interested in the the item that made today's agenda around meta ledger my firm is actually starting to evaluate it so got some some particular interest in that part for today absolutely well welcome and thank you for joining us uh so we already got uh information on an upcoming event within linux foundation public health and consensus health there's also one all the way in march coming up with the british blockchain association which is gonna be the Blockchain International Science Conference. It's their fourth running of this show. And uh, I attended, I believe, two years ago and I found it very beneficial. It had more of a worldview, more of an EU, a UK view uh, than we typically get here within a Hyperledger in the United States activity when it comes to blockchain and healthcare. But I highly encourage anyone, if, if their company can sponsor it, uh, I think it's about a hundred US dollars to be able to join, but, uh, something like that uh, but British International Science Conference check out the link and also I will share this link in the chat so everyone can just access the links instead of just staring at the thing that I'm sharing so I'm putting that on right now cool all right and we'll go into industry news and research group items uh, but also before we get into that is there any events i'm missing are there any upcoming events and presentations that people can add in the chat that i can add into here as well uh, that we should be looking out for in january or february All right, I guess I got it covered. Okay, industry news, research and group action items. So research came out about uh, uh, two weeks ago that was uh, accredited, accredited and published broadly, though most of the research came in 2019 and 2020 from the University of Birmingham on the health sector's experience of blockchain and cross-disciplinary investigation of real transformative potential. Uh, I thought this was substantive research like very good research and showed some of the difficulties and the strengths of the space very well. Uh, they went into a lot of great detail in the use cases and mostly through use cases within the United States and within the UK. So we'll go through this paper a little bit. They talked about, uh, you know, there's more, people are more talking about the experiences, like they mentioned professional credentials exchange, which is the uh, blockchain, physician credentialing use case. 
They mentioned the one that I am very close with within Humana and the Synaptic Health Alliance for provider data exchange and using a blockchain to be able to bring those records and things together. And they also mentioned, I believe, Melody and, uh, and the Substrate project as well. That might be in another page. But, um, oh, they mentioned the Coalesce Health Alliance. So Coalesce is not uh, active anymore. Uh, they are uh, they were the ones that used the entities within Blue Cross Blue Shield to help in uh, providing organizational units with linked real-time access to standard set of spend data across Blue Shield members. Uh, so they, they highlighted those, they highlighted the United Kingdom. Yeah, this is where I believe they mentioned Melody and they mentioned the, the guard time and in, in, instant access medical health gateway uh, project there. Uh, so they highlight some very beneficial consortias and projects that are out there in industry today. Uh, they also talked about some transnational blockchain systems. This is where they talked about Melody. Uh, so we're all pretty familiar with these use cases and these, uh, these concepts and talked about federated learning and how that's beneficial. The challenges though, I thought they were pretty spot on. So blockchain and healthcare implementation challenges, it's organizational commitment, it's the interoperability approach, it's internal governance standardization, and then uh, the normative tensions I think were pretty spot on as well. Uh, so I, I thought this research really hit the nail on the head when it comes to not many people understand it. There's not enough rails to be able to connect different bridges. Most of these things are permissionless and though permission blockchains do have value within the members, if they wanna be able to expand more value, they need to go into public uh, blockchain solutions to be able to, to hash and be able to connect with many different uh, multidisciplinary uh, members of cooperative models and that only permission blockchains will give you incremental improvements, though public blockchains will give you radical and uh, disruptive improvements into uh, different sectors. And, uh, and th that was kind of like the overview of this research. It had more of a negative bent that like these concepts, unless you get the, they're more social trust problems and computational trust problems, which we have discussed in these forums as well uh, as being uh, major to development. But I wanted to know if anyone else took a look at this research or has an opinion on the things we just mentioned. Anything whatsoever? Did anything hit a chord for anybody? <laughs> All right. Well, I, I assume everyone has to take a, re a read at this and uh, and give it some more thought. But yeah, I I thought this was highly accurate. It does have more of a a dated publication as most of this research came from 2019. But uh, I highly encourage everyone to take a look at this and uh, and give it a read. It has a lot of good commentary from people in the space that we all respect. So uh, give it a go. All right, next up, I wanted to be able to highlight, uh, I believe it's Region Strife uh, Institute and the National Institutes of Health have created privacy preserving record linkage technology for COVID-19 clinical research. What that looked like was being able to leverage the Regan Strife's uh, record linkage technology, they were able to advance COVID-19 clinical research, the data. As we know that uh, federated learning and privacy preserving technologies where you can be able to send the model, not the data, and be able to uh, keep actual data that may be compromising at bay while interacting with the valuable data sets and the, the, the clinical data sets that may be valuable. Uh, this was another use case of, of how to be able to do so. And uh, he noted that when sites contribute to EHR data for their patients, they can define what kind of linkage they agree to. For instance, if they choose to link to mortality data, but not test data. And consent and prior auth data in networks and consortia are highly valuable. I know that my group at Humana has done a lot of research into this and has been looking to find ways where we could be able to uh, maximize consented data in networks rather than the, the things that may be compromised or not valuable for consortia. And another valuable example of how uh, a company has done this. And for NIH, it's, 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 very, uh, it's very applicable. Uh, for one, uh, they, they made a contract that's worth more than 
$3 million over the first year, and they're looking to expand in with that. And this is for COVID specific data, right? So uh, in emergency situations, some data may be more valuable than others, like mortality data or like respiratory data than other things there. So any other opinions or, or commentary here? So, uh, so, so Mike, uh, the, the just first glimpse, you know, over this paper, and then uh, so I touch it touch a uh, important uh, topic is you know it is you know privacy preserving, and then uh, so this is one thing that you know blockchain's been look at because it is an inherent characteristics you know, of the system. So uh, I would look more about this paper and share with you about, okay, uh, what inspirations you know this can bring to academia and also to the industry. So I would love to discuss with you more about this later on if I get a chance. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, and part of that privacy preservation is that the tokens contain no relationship with the true identifiers, and they can't be used to reproduce the identifiers. So. Uh, like we all know within blockchain, like the data is not actually live on chain. It just shows a hash. And so the hashes that are agreed upon to be able to be distributed to the members within the network of the consortia uh, are then made into a token. And then when that token is approved upon, that is an accessible to all the participants as part of the network as well. So uh, that's a part of it. But yeah, we definitely could, uh, could enjoy a further discussion on this and, and how it's valuable. And then it's interesting here that someone serves as a as a linkage linkaged honest broker because I guess someone in the that federated consortia needs to be able to combine the different data sets together and so they kind of if anything have access to all the data that's usable within this which strikes me as it doesn't it's not truly privacy preserving because then someone or you know, even though it's a trusted broker, it's still like a third party that could, like humans inevitably uh, cannot be fully trusted. Uh, just the machines can know because machines just told yes or no, right or wrong. Whereas humans, you know, we have different conventions and things that make us uh, potentially compromise things or not. Like we're more in a gray area and there's not a guarantee that there's full privacy pres preservation. But I think for this small set uh, and this, use case it's valuable because you know you just want to be able to have an or curator or orchestrator be able to get it out to all the right parties uh which is probably valuable but i think for data sets that are more compromising where no one would want to have anything transacted or shared uh this could be uh less beneficial yes adrian go ahead so um if anybody's looked at this uh uh what kind of transparency provisions are there for the individual uh, patient uh, when technologies like this, whether they're being centralized or not, in the sense that you just mentioned, uh, I, I find it really concerning that uh, a lot of this sort of presumes HIPAA's uh, de-anonymization rules and things like that as a way to avoid transparency in what's going on, uh, both at the community level and at the individual level. Uh, so uh, if anybody is familiar with uh, PPRL in this respect, I'd love to know more. Thank you. I'm personally not as uh, familiar with PPRL, but if anyone else, please chime in. In other words, it says right there, it's a, it's a way of avoiding patient consent. Uh, you know, it's right there at the top of your yeah, screen. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, um, you know, uh, that's the point I'm making. Not true identifiers are used. Yeah, I, I'd be interested what identifiers are used then in that transaction. So, so, uh, so, so this is the first time I hear about this term. P, uh, P, P, R, L. So, so you talk about is a way to avoid patient consent. So, so does that mean that uh, traditionally we want to collect anything from a, a respondent 
or the people who we hope to get information from, we need to get a consent from them, right? So, so this is saying that like most of the data that could be compromised and uh, in HIPAA or GDPR standards isn't transacted and that is preserved in privacy through the PPRL method, I think is what they're, they're saying. Okay, so does that mean that once we use this technique or this, uh, this technology called P, uh, PPRL, we no longer need to get the patient's consent? Or we still need that is to what they're claiming that they're able to do with NIH and potentially CMS here as well, I'm saying. Okay. I mean, I, I wanna just, I'm not gonna belabor this. I wanna just put this in context. Uh, you know, the Tuskegee experiment fiasco is kind of the, the example case, the, uh, the poster child for what I'm talking about. Um, it, it's easy, uh, whether it's Tuskegee, Tuskegee or, uh, you know, uh, Google make a deal with London Hospital Trust to get data. Um, it, it's easy to have an impact on uh, a population or society as a whole that is acceptable to the participants of this federation, uh, like the one they're describing, but is otherwise secret or not shared uh, openly um, with uh, other people. And so we have to be very, very careful when we talk about arrangements like this, uh, because it's uh, both parties, you know, both the parties that collect the data and the parties that uh, learn from the data or use the data have an interest in these things going forward. And uh, there's often very little oversight uh, from the social perspective. Totally agree. And they'll soon incorporate CMS claims data, which good luck. I've been living in that for a while now and it's, it's not fun, but that'll be interesting to see how it grows. All right, next up. Uh, so recently McKesson shared their experience with working with Chronicle and the Megaledger Consortium uh, with, uh, in regards to contracts and chargebacks uh, in pharmaceutical management. Uh, they will pull this up. Uh, so through the Metalegic Consortium, which is created by Chronicle and, and the company led by Suzanne Somerville, uh, they've used the digital solution where chargebacks happen in wholesale distributors to sell medicine, but pricing and eligibility contracts are negotiated separately, which can complicate the transactions leading to all those chargebacks. So it helps smooth out that they use a, a blockchain technology to be able to reduce complexity of procurement for health systems as they face challenges with rebilling. And the effort towards optimizing the process expected to reduce errors by 98% on MetaLedger. And uh, these are some of the findings that they published out with MetaLedger and, and everything within their working group. Uh, this is still within, uh, this is still just an, a working group similar to what we have within Hyperledger and hasn't been uh, productized and hasn't been made widely available for anyone to be able to join, but through McKesson and their partners, they've been able to uh, create an estimated $500 million in value by eliminating duplicate efforts due to using a chain system. Uh, I believe, uh, don't quote me on this, I believe they're using a quorum blockchain that might be using Hyperledger Fabric as well. I know in different uh, working groups and consortia, they've used both, but uh, very interesting and uh, and love to hear anyone else's opinion on this. So it sounds like they actually would have transaction pricing, product pricing verified against contract based on records on the blockchain. Is that, is that what you're interpreting here as well? So I think a lot of times is once a particular pharmaceutical is tied to an, an event, that that event is then hashed and timestamped. And so the original timestamp of that pharmaceutical is then realized as the record of truth. And then anyone moving forward can then be tied back, like, no, the original payment actually happened here. Or some reconciliation goes through smart contracts to be able to make sure that the either the patient or the distributor, the manufacturer, all can agree upon this timestamp and this date. 
and just automates the process of getting to reconciliation quicker. And, and that's more so where I think the, the blockchain network comes in. But it's permissioned. So you have to be a permissioned entity to be able to access that, um, that reconciliation piece through the smart contract. Okay. Yeah, because it, it doesn't sound like they're, they're chasing the pharmaceutical provenance, right? It's, it's really about the, the transaction itself. Yeah, it's a transaction right. payment, not actually like yeah. if the pharmaceutical. So I guess a part of that is like the provenance of it. Like if it was the right drug that actually made it to the patient's hands. I believe they're not getting patients to validate this per se. It's mostly just the manufacturer and the distributor. Uh, so that, that's more so where I'm, I'm seeing this being used. Okay. Yeah. So I, as I mentioned, I'm in the, in the, um, the healthcare supply chain uh, at my firm and I'm, I'm quite familiar with the contracting process, that pricing and eligibility piece that they mentioned up front is, is where it gets really interesting because the contracts themselves are complex. Mm -hmm. The price is just negotiated. Um, they, they have a lot of, uh, there's a lot of conditions to achieving a certain price for a healthcare provider. And so that, that's the part that I'm interested in is capturing the transaction is one thing, but my sense is that the chargebacks are largely happening because the, the transaction executed at a price that wasn't consistent with the actual contract that was in place because everyone and all parties to the transaction have such a hard time of confirming that the correct price is determined. And they're also in like one-to-one -one relationships. Like, let's just say you have all these... I know traditionally a lot of people have them on like SharePoints or Excel sheets where they just... They validate that this is the drug price and it's agreed upon and, mm -hmm. and they have that between one or two partners. But if there's many different organizations that are then trying to agree upon and be able to, as a coordinated group, agree upon this, instead of using one-to-one -one centralized relationships, they use a distributed uh, method to be able to see the price all in real time more so and then agreeing upon whether that's right or wrong or whether it's <laughs> yeah. in the framework, so. Yeah, that's exactly right. There's usually, I think, typically four parties to these transactions when you include reimbursement for them. And so, yeah, everyone has a different opinion of what the price should be. And that's where all this chargeback and manual work comes in is trying to, after the fact, then figure out whether it was correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. Anyone else on this piece? And this was just after the fact, kind of just, you know, it's kind of like a market marketing play to showcase that they had a real, a real product that exceeded value. So um, kudos to the team over at Chronicle. All right. We'll go on to the next one. So a couple of progress points from uh, Vita or Vitadal. Uh, I say it different ways because I'm an American, but uh, uh, the team at Molecule, Molecule is kind of a, a blockchain DAO orchestration company where they're looking to create many different DAOs to be able to incentivize scientific funding and research for specific cases where maybe uh, they're not getting funded in, in major entities, but they could be in individual bases. So one, Molecule uh, created their second um, IP uh rights and data access function via an IP NFT. Uh, they did one earlier this summer that transacted value. This one was more of a creating an art uh, for like an NFT. So you're also selling like the artistic value, but then you're also then granting access to specific data that could be used for uh, autography. So uh, I can't say that word, sorry. I, some scientific words I'm just not great at. But uh, the, the benefit here is that a community in a DAO was able to then benefit and fund this NFT that then gave access to particular data that would be great for this type of solution and problem. And uh, it was particular to uh, the Kowalchuk Lab. Kowalchuk Lab. Uh, I think they're based in... Yeah, they're based in New Newcastle. And so people from all over the world and online community were able to fund this data to be publicly accessible for others to be able to utilize uh, within longevity research. So 
another hat tip to Vitadel and everything they've done there. Very beneficial for the space and showcases another reason why decentralized science or the DSI movement as now is coming on in Twitter and all these other online forums could be highly valuable. And uh, it was transacted for 285 USDC. Very valuable and beneficial to the lab. So this lab may not be able to be funded by University of Newcastle or by investment or private equity, but a community thought it was valuable enough to transact $285,000 or USDCs into it. Hey, Mike, it's Erica. I have a question. Um, so wh whoever purchased this, what do they get? They get access to the data from the lab? Or I'm just trying to wrap my head around So Vita DAO, the DAO owns the piece of art and they own the IP rights. And the oh, access. so they purchased it. Okay. Yeah, they- The DAO, uh, the DAO like voted on it and purchased it. Yeah, okay. so anyone that's part of the DAO can then access that data. And the data is coming from this lab. Correct. Okay, I'm just, yeah, <laughs> interesting. All right. I know, it's tough to, to get your mind around at first glance, but yeah. Okay, thanks. Oh, um, so, so Mike, so the use of the uh, NF2 is actually nothing to do with the, the data, the data set, right? The, Say that again, the use of art. art. Oh, so the, art you, the art is just, uh, it's kind of just like the, um, it was like the profile picture of the data. Um, okay. It's kind of just a pretty thing to make it look cool um, when you're selling Okay, so it. Other like a pop on a data, on our, on promotion for publicity, right? Is it like it promotion? So it would be like a, a promotion for, or, or like a, for publicity purposes, right? Yeah, for sure. Okay, okay. Okay, so this is interesting. Okay, so uh, the the, the NFT, you know, non-fungible token can be used for the marketing or promotion purposes. Mm -hmm. I'll beat the, the actual thing being transacted at is the data set. The data set is transacted with people within the Vita DAO. So if you're part of the DAO, right, if you're a member of that DAO and you pay mm -hmm. whatever the, the membership is to be part of the DAO, you then through that membership get the access rights to that data. Oh, okay. Okay, so you, you are like, you know, uh, paying to join a club. And yeah. then once you are into the club and you have access to that asset, you know, which is the data you need to do for the research or for, for analysis. Correct, okay. but it, the, the fee and the, the, you know, what you have to pay to be part of that is less within the DAO because it's distributed across many other like-minded scientists or people that really could want to access that data. So you individually, if you wanted to access that data from the Coral Chuck Lab at Newcastle, uh, at the University of Newcastle, it may cost you thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars. But as an individual, it may only cost you maybe 500 to thousand dollars to be able to access it. So it makes it cheaper for the individual, but as a group and a whole, you all have mutually beneficial access to the data now. Oh, that's a great uh, innovation. Innovation. That, that, yeah, that's good. That's good innovation. Why well, yeah. we highlight it here? No, it is. Yeah. yeah. I wonder if there would be restrictions uh, for the DAO who can access it within the DAO. Because could I just join the DAO and then look at the data? I'd, I'd wonder. Imagine they wouldn't want that. Uh, that's kind of what. It, you could join the DAO and access this data, yeah. I, but I mean, what's prohibiting someone from joining, right? Like the the uh, the onboarding and the verification process. I think they're trying to validate through ORC IDs or um, you know different. E, like you have to have an EDU email in some cases mm -hmm. for some of these things. So uh, the validation, the the digital identity verification process is probably the toughest thing within Molecule and Vita DAO to try and manage, but I definitely know they're working on it. So that just not like, but even so that they kind of encourage like biohackers and anyone to be part of this as well. Uh, so I don't think it's a very strenuous, and pro strenuous process. Yeah, it makes sense. Mike, just to get a broader understanding, uh, so Vitadel, are they in the, the um, research data space? 
they're in the crypto web three space. Uh, so Molecule is founded by one person who I used to work with at a company called Consensus. Consensus is like an Ethereum blockchain solution provider. Uh, and then another person named Tyler Galato, who is a former research scientist uh, and believes in certain research that has been underfunded for years where individuals and potential biohackers could be part of it as well. And not biohackers like they're trying to destroy people's lives. It's more people that are interested in pharmaceuticals and interested in the benefits of, of certain things and, and how they could do it on their own rather than being part of a lab. And so molecules creating different DAOs, like they have Vita DAO, which is for longevity research. They have another one called Psy DAO, which is for uh, psychedelics and mental health research. And uh, in these DAOs, they're going to target specific members to be to help with scientific funding and, and, and research that could utilize the data information and can uh, want to benefit or fund specific research that they believe and they're passionate about. And they'll do it with their own time and money, but they'll do it because they're passionate about it or the individual contributor or the group is very passionate about it. And so it more decentralizes instead of leaving like, private equity investors, major universities and funds and labs as the only people that can fund these things, it decentralizes the model for individuals to be able to contribute funds to it. Great, thank you for that. Hey Mike, are they actually doing the research or are they, like how are they, how are they taking that step to actually use the data that they're receiving and, and doing something with it? I imagine a lot of the members of the DAO are, re, are data researchers or CROs or could, benefit from this because it'll benefit them in the pharmaceuticals and the therapeutics they create. Um, I assume like you're only putting money to this if you could utilize the actual thing, right? Like I'm only going to be part of uh, like for one, there's something called Lynx DAO for golfers out there, right? I'm only going to be part of Lynx DAO if I like to play golf, right? Or if I can utilize a course that they're going to eventually own as a group one day, right? So I assume most of the people that are part of that DAO either utilize that data or can receive some type of monetary or social benefit from accessing it. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I'd just be interested to see what they actually do with it. Yeah. Thanks. Absolutely. Cool. And we will move on to the other part. So uh, another thing from Vita DAO, Vita, I call it Vita DAO, whatever. I, I'm just going to keep on calling it Vita DAO. <laughs> um, you're now able to, to purchase a glycogen test, I believe. Uh, yeah, a glycan age test uh, to get your insights of your glycome and biological age uh, through your Vita tokens. So if you're part of Vita DAO or Vita DAO in particular, uh, and you can use Vita and other cryptocurrencies to buy this test to be able to get insights into your glycogen and biological age. Very interesting, very, all you have to do is just scan the QR code, pay the certain amount of Vita or whatever the uh, standard like conversion rate is between like Ethereum, Bitcoin or whatever your crypto is, and you pay to be able to access this test. Um, very beneficial because I think people that are crypto rich would benefit in this. Whereas if they don't have fiat currency or other things to purchase this, it, uh, but they have crypto, it, it makes it valuable for them. So very interesting use case here. Wanted to share it for everyone. All right. Next, uh, Brian Armstrong in the holiday break, actually. So Brian Armstrong is the founder of Coinbase. He came out with an epigenetic, epigenetic reprogramming company to help extend the human lifespan. If we're continuing on the whole longevity piece here. So uh, he's creating a company that is helping to uh, reprogram the human gene expression. Similarly, what this really is, is he's trying to reprogram and treat the end of human life as the disease, right? So we're only on average, I think males last about 80 years old or 78 years old, women last about 80 years old, especially in the United States in particular. And Brian's trying to create a company that'll target that problem as the disease and create solutions and, and concepts and therapeutics that help uh, people live longer. 
is, is his uh, general goal here. So it, to, to be fair, why is he focused so much in the space? His wife is actually a geneticist or she's either like a, a clinical informatics geneticist or a geneticist somewhere in the San Francisco, California area at an actual hospital. So uh, I think he's getting a lot of these motivations from his wife where his wife can eventually work into these type of things too. Uh, but uh, a very interesting concept then. Uh, he hasn't said anything about crypto or, or blockchain being involved in this. I just thought it was interesting that the man who runs one of the largest centralized exchanges in the world uh, is focused so much in the space. I want to highlight for everyone. And also it doesn't hurt when you're worth billions. You could work on projects that are interesting for you. So, All right. Uh, one of the ones that last things that are particularly involved in blockchain healthcare, uh, uh, an individual named uh, Nikhil, oh God, I always forget his last name, but his Twitter handle is Nikhil in it. He comes up with a lot of different marketing material and ideas within the healthcare space through his blog called Out of Pocket. He had some interesting ideas with, for crypto and healthcare, such as decentralized EMRs, insurance styles, and drug picking models. Uh, that I thought were highly interesting and should be relevant for us to discuss here. So um, he featured some jobs. He's talked about the crypto pill, what, how blockchain works and all those things. Uh, decentralized EMR could be interesting. Start attracting users and third-party developers who can build features on top to make the user experience more valuable. It's something like Epic. It ends up attracting more users, attracting third-party developers. Eventually, it makes more sense for platforms to extract increasingly more value. Now, why does someone believe this will work or why does someone believe this won't work? One, I think it won't work because uh, Epic and Center don't have the incentive to do so. Uh, they pay a lot of developers on their teams already to add certain features and to work with hospitals and to do the educational piece here and making sure this is actually relevant for them. Uh, and, and they have a fee for service type of model, right? Where they, they don't really open source or decentralize many, if anything, out. And they are making a very good dollar on that service. So uh, unless, you know, they have the incentive to really change their model, like unless more of their users and more hospitals are going to decentralized file storage or they're going to other things like that. I don't know if it would be as relevant for them to do it. Though their features would get better and this could be a way for them to enhance features and enhance experiences. I'm not sure that they have the, the real incentive to do so. Yeah, I was just gonna say, Mike, um, we don't really have a way to prove that you know this can offer something better than what they already offer in an evidence-based way that, that healthcare organizations will listen to. Um, so there's, it's really hard to, you know, aside from the incentive, we don't have like a proof in a way that is digestible for healthcare executives and organizations to listen to. Yeah. Anyone else have an opinion on that within the EMRs in general? I also think generally a lot of people that utilize EMRs and EHRs the most that have rare and chronic conditions um, that could extract the most valuable from value from their EMR. Uh, a lot of times, if you ever notice when you're sick or if you, and this is not across the board, this is just generally speaking, and, and most data and analytics are coming from here. Generally, when you're sick, you actually want to look at screens less and you want to interact with online communities less a little bit uh, due to various different factors. Uh, I think you know, like healthy people's data is not as valuable in EMRs and unless you're talking about certain other things. And those, those things just aren't as valuable to create pharmaceuticals or therapies for. Until you get people uh, who are in rare chronic state wanting to constantly be online, I don't know if that'll be a really valuable thing, but I could be proven wrong. I think insurance styles have a, uh, actual um, have actual relevance here. So you mentioned about Nexus Mutual. We've done that a lot here in, in this group. Uh, Nexus Mutual is a global mutual fund that you can pull insurance together with other people. Yet uh, they've had some issues recently when it comes to like cases that were verbally 
uh, disclosed to being covered actually weren't covered through the smart contract. And the smart contracts, as we all know, that once you create a smart contract, uh, unless you're using Tezos, uh, you can't really edit or improve the smart contract unless you're in a private permission blockchain. If you're in a public one, it's very hard to edit those smart contracts. They're kind of, once you make it, it's, it's very hard to change or, or edit. Um, <clears throat> but I do believe like for claims uh, of catastrophic events, like not like covering your dental or covering your vision, but if you were to get in a car accident or you would have a heart attack, and things like that, I think insurance styles in those cases would be highly valuable for people to join. Um, and instead of covering the minimal things, just doing for things that really, uh, really take a, take some of the most catastrophic catastrophic events, it could be highly valuable. So it could work like this. Does anyone else have an opinion on this too? All right, guess not. Uh, so Mike, yeah. So my my first impression about this uh, this uh, flow chart is that this is a process, right? And then from the beginning to the end, that you know, I think blockchain offers you know a perfect you know, platform to 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 implement this for sure. And now <clears throat> the the point is, if you won't try, <clears throat> if we try to approach it from like uh, startups or like innovators' perspectives, you know, who's gonna stand out to propose this? Would this uh, belongs more to the, the, the private sector or individuals, or this uh, belongs to more about the, the public sector, the government? And then, so who, who, who enjoys the better position to, 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 to propose this? It's a very good question. Um, I think you propose this if you're, well, for the insurance case, you propose your health insurance company to you and your stakeholders and say, hey, mm -hmm. if we want to take less risk on some of the lower things, but we'll take it on the higher things and we'll allow our members to make the decision there, and you kind of do it that way. That's the most effective way. A government entity could propose this and be pretty successful. I don't think like a patient community could be very successful in doing this, right? Uh, mm -hmm. There's plenty of patient-based communities out there on Facebook groups and, and uh, health union and, and other type of uh, social media outlets. But, uh, but yeah, those are some methods to do so. Yeah, the, I, my first impression is that the, the insurance companies or the, the medical institutions, they may have more incentive to build this, right? So if we- Yeah, to separate this, themselves uh, like, from the actual insurance provider, for sure, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but this Make is a local good, and community-based house. Yeah. yeah, this is a good, very good idea. You know, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The last one on here was the drug pictures meta model. And they talked about Numerai, the trades meta model data, on the top of models from data scientists. <laughs> he was thinking of doing this particular for, uh, for drug pickers, I forget this one particularly, but he pretty much wanted to create a numeri in particular for data scientists who are working with uh, pharmaceutical data in particular. So, uh, um, yeah, I originally I think this is valuable because I think if you're like for algorithms, like numeri sells like AI algorithms in a marketplace for someone else to pick up and utilize. I think if you were to do this for pharmaceutical algorithms, though the pharmaceutical companies pay hundreds of thousands of dollars to people to create these models and to be part of their team only in a centralized way. If someone who's just really good at creating algorithmic models can put this on an open marketplace, they could probably benefit from doing this as well. So uh, it's just more decentralizing the model rather than having an individual company just benefit from it. It's the, the contributor of the AI model, put it in a marketplace, see how it's utilized and, and beneficial to the, the, the actual pharmaceutical company or therapeutic company, and they decide on there, so. Highly interesting on there. 
I then also had a, a story on botanical water technologies, uh, blockchain for transparent and secure water trading uh, for those that are interested in environmental cases. And then UK.gov is moving to fully digital documents for right to work, criminal record checks, and digital IDs. They're one of the first governments to do it fully digital. I believe Singapore is there and Estonia is there. But now uh, UK is uh, looking to migrate into the digital world as well. Uh, we have five minutes left, so I want to make room for anyone to talk about comments or things that are educational in the space to them. Uh, I would like to highlight here in the educational nuggets. These are more so for people that are just learning blockchain and, and want to be able to understand how it's being used uh, in industry and, and likewise. Uh, the, Siki, the Shiki Science Show was with Brian Armstrong and Patrick Joyce, who has actually spoken with us here at the Hyperledger Healthcare SIG before about Research Hub, his project longevity and why scientific research should be open source. Highly encouraged to take the hour to listen to that. Uh, there's a recording of the European Blockchain Convention on health data on blockchain that will benefit patients, doctors, and manufacturers with some people from Farm Ledger, Consensus Health, and others. Uh, this news article talking about how passwordless authentication and blockchain can help in cybersecurity in 2022, especially in healthcare, definitely take a look at that. Uh, and, oh, I really liked this Pioneer Square Labs engineering and engineers hype free observations on Web3 and what it potential can be. Uh, but plenty of uh, beneficial things to learn about and read on your spare time. Uh, but yeah, are there any other questions or comments the community would like to share? Uh, Mike, you know, I, I, I'm really thrilled, you know, to, to uh, attend this meeting. So after today's meeting, uh, do you have a couple of seconds so that we can stay, so that we, I can check with you if you get some time or we can uh, set up another time? Uh, I have an 11 o'clock meeting, but uh, you, if you email me at the Gmail I sent earlier, uh, we can find time to talk. Okay, great, fantastic. Thank you, Mike. Of course. Anyone else? Happy New Year, Sean. Thank you. All right. Well, I'm going to stop the share then. And uh, Happy New Year, everyone. Does anyone have any fun stories or, or things that 